In this lecture, we will review thinking, language, and cognition. So, what are you thinking about at this moment? The mere ability to pose such a question underscores the distinctive nature of the human ability to think. No other species contemplates, analyzes, recollects, or plans the way humans do. Understanding what thinking is, however, goes beyond knowing what we think. Philosophers, for example, have argued for generations about the meaning of thinking. Psychologists define thinking as the manipulation of mental representations of information. A representation may take a form of a word, a visual image, a sound, or data in any other sensory modality scores in memory. Thinking transforms a particular representation of information into new and different forms, allowing us to answer questions, solve problems, or reach goals. Although a clear sense of what specifically occurs when we think remains elusive, our understanding or the nature of the fundamental elements involved in thinking is growing. We begin by considering our use of mental images and concepts, the building blocks of thought. So, mental images are representations in the mind of an object or event. They are not just visual representations. Our ability to hear a tune in our heads also implies on a mental image. In fact, every sensory modality may produce corresponding mental images. Mental imagery may improve other types of skills as well. For example, piano players who simply mentally rehearse and exercise show brain activity that is virtually identical to that of the people who actually practice the exercise manually. Now let us review concepts, how we categorize the world. If someone asks you, what is in your kitchen cabinet? You might answer with a detailed list of items, like for example, a jar of peanut butter, three boxes of spaghetti, six unmatched dinner plates, and so forth. More likely though, you would respond by naming some broader categories, such as food or dishes. Using such categories reflects the operation of concepts. So, concepts are mental groupings of similar objects, events, or people. Concepts enable us to organize complex phenomena into simpler and therefore more easily usable cognitive categories. So, when psychologists who study cognition focus on the mental activities associated with thinking, knowing, remembering, and communication, one of these activities is forming concepts. And again, concepts are mental groupings of similar objects, events, ideas, or people. The concept chair includes many items. For example, a baby's high chair, a reclining chair, a dentist chair, a love seat, a sofa. Other concepts, often those with the most relevance to our everyday lives, such as table and bird, have a set of general, relativity loose characteristic features rather than unique, clearly defined properties that distinguish an example of the concept from a non-example. When we consider these more ambiguous concepts, we usually think in terms of examples called prototypes. So, Prototypes are typical, highly representative examples of a concept that correspond to our mental image or 
best example of the concept. For example, although a robin and an ostrich are both example of birds, the robin is an example that comes to most people's minds far more readily. Consequently, robin is a prototype of the concept bird. Similarly, when we think of the concept of a table, we're likely to think of a coffee table before we think of a drafting table, making a coffee table closer to our prototype of a table. So again, we often form our concepts by developing prototypes. And a prototype is a mental image or best example of a category. So now let's move on to language development. How do people use language? Well, first of all, language is the communication of information through symbols arranged according to systematic rules. All languages have a grammar, a system of rules that determines how thoughts can be expressed. That encompasses the three major components of language phonology, syntax, and semantics. Language production, which follows language comprehension, develops out of a babbling sound, which then leads to the production of actual words. After one year of age, children use two-word combinations, increase their vocabulary, and use telegraphic speech, which drops words not critical to the message. By age five, acquisition of language rules is relatively complete. Now, learning theories suggest that language is acquired through reinforcement and conditioning. In contrast, the nativist approach suggests that an innate language acquisition device guides the development of language. Their interactionist approach argues that language development is produced through a combination of genetically determined predispositions and environmental circumstances that help teach language. The linguistic relativity hypothesis suggests that language shapes and may determine the way people think about the world. Most evidence suggests that although language does not determine thought, it does affect the way people store information in memory and how well they can retrieve it. The degree to which language is a uniquely human skill remains an open question. Some psychologists contend that even though certain primates communicate at a high level, those animals do not use language. Other psychologists suggest that those primates truly understand and produce language in much the same way as humans do. People who speak more than one language may have a cognitive advantage over those who speak only one language. Again, language is more than vibrating air. It is our spoken, written, or signed words and the ways we combine them to communicate meaning. Linguist Norm Chomsky has argued that language is an unlearned human trait, separate from other parts of human cognition. He theorized that a built-in predisposition to learn grammar rules, which he called universal grammar, helps explain why preschoolers pick up language so readily and use grammar so well. It happens so naturally, as naturally as birds learn to fly. Whether we are in the linguistic minority or majority, language links us to one another. Language also connects us to the past and the future. To destroy a people, goes a saying, is to destroy their language.